welcome back to Tap Tempo with me, Matt Lang. A couple things on the docket before we get into the conversation with Kevin. First of all, the Crystal Method remix of Ordinary Love, my new single with Denise Reno, just came out on Friday. The Crystal Method is absolutely a legend within the dance music world and rave scene and everything like that. So it's an honor to have Scott put his hand on it. And uh, I think it's awesome. So go check that out. For the gear nerds, last summer I recorded a video with Earthquaker Devices. They are a guitar pedal company. They make incredibly unique and fun guitar pedals. And uh, they have a series called Bored to Death where basically artists go through their gear and how they're using guitar pedals and often the Earthquaker pedals themselves. So we filmed this piece last summer at basically an old like punk rock venue in downtown LA called The Smell. And it showcases how I use modular synthesizers and guitars together with guitar pedals and kind of jam out. And uh, I think it's cool. It's uh, It looks great. They did a phenomenal job with it. So go check that out if you are into the gear nerdy stuff. Now coming up is my conversation with Kevin Antriasian. He played guitar in Dillinger Escape Plan for a number of years. And he also runs a recording studio called Backroom Studios in New Jersey. He is a very knowledgeable person when it comes to recording as well as playing guitar. I sincerely look up to him. Dillinger was one of my favorite bands growing up, and I still have the utmost respect for them. So I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. Hey, folks. Welcome back to Tap Tempo. My guest this week is Kevin Antriasian, and he is... I know I nailed it. You got um, it good. <laughs> <laughs> producer and recording engineer, and as well as, most notably, uh, one of the guitarists in the Dillinger Escape Plan. Which, as a personal note for me, like I grew up, uh, I think when I was 15. Yeah, I was at National Guitar Workshop. Um, I don't know if you ever knew of NGW. It was in uh, New Milford, Connecticut. Okay. Basically, you know, band camp for guitarists. And uh, one of my guitar and teachers, name, he was from Jersey too. His name was Tom Spears. He gave me... That name uh, actually uh, sounds familiar, which strangely yeah, enough, I'll have to look I it think up. he's from Morristown. So yeah, I, that he's sounds like, familiar. Yeah, I'll so later. Uh, you should, yeah, I'd be curious, but uh, but he introduced me to calculating infinity, and that, I mean, I I, I still don't get it. Like, <laughs> it's the I most... say this all the time. Yeah, the first time I listened to that record, uh, I was just told by my friends who were like really into that stuff. So like, yeah, it was way beyond my reach at that point. They're like, get this record, get into it. You know, we want to do songs like this, blah, blah, blah. I was like, okay. And I I bought it and I listened to it and I, I gave it away like, imme- like almost oh, immediately no afterwards. I could not understand what's happening. I was like, this sounds like trash. <laughs> oh, that that's, that's, I didn't, oh, I thought it sounded incredible. I was just so. Really? Con- no, for uh, me, it was just like, it was like, a, it was like someone took a song and put it in a blender and like put it in a trash can and I kicked it down the stairs. Oh my God. That's, that's what it sounded like to me. Yeah. I, I had the total opposite reaction where I just thought it was the most insane thing I had ever ever heard in my life and yeah of course i was probably like two or three years into learning guitar at that point so i was getting to the point where i was getting really obsessed with technique Mm -hmm. and then hearing something like well i mean was it sugar coated sour the first track off of it which that's my favorite one on that record it just starts with just chaos (laughs) and and even like two days ago, so I pulled it up just to uh, like I looked up like the tab of it on uh, I think Songster or one of those things. Like, yeah, it's probably yeah. totally wrong, by the way. <laughs> oh, I, 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 I'm sure I don't know if anyone could ever transcribe that stuff properly. But I I, I played with it for 20 minutes, like not happening at all. <laughs> yeah, that's a tough one, man. I mean, when I, when I was learning those songs to, for you know when I got into the band, it was uh, mm-hmm. that was a. Tricky one, but but because that album is like, I mean, at this point, so close to me, and it's probably one of my top three Dillinger records for sure. Yeah, um, you know, playing that song is probably one of my top f- songs to play live out of any Dillinger song. Like, I love the energy that song has, and it's just relentless. There's like a small like break pause for you to breathe in the right. middle, and then it's over fast, and it just hits so hard. It's such a good tune and just the energy that they had when they when they wrote that it's just so pure and just like raw i love it love everything about that song i mean something that's always confused me about you guys especially like when you'd play live is i mean the live show was absolute chaos as well yet you would hit yeah. all the stops <laughs> the key is the stops are hit <laughs> that's the key <laughs> the stuff in between it can sometimes be a little cloudy but like the stops right. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, obviously a big part of that is, is down to the rhythm section. Yeah. Um, and playing with Billy is like, you know, it's almost like cheating. Right. He's so good. <laughs> you know. It's like it's like, other- it's like having a, a race car, but like the the it's like a like a big block Chevy that like will never ever fail. It's like right, always right, super right. reliable. Like, you know, yeah, he's he's fantastic. That's great. The other thing that always amazed me too is the uh you'd watch the crowds. And most of these people obviously don't know a thing about music, really. And they would know all the time changes. Yeah. It's like yeah. Rush fans, Lena. Yeah. <laughs> do it on the fields. Got right. it on the fields. <laughs> and I mean, like, let's not kid ourselves. I mean, you make Rush's time signatures seem like, seem like preschool. <laughs> oh, man. It, it was insane to me. But um, how did you get involved with the band originally? Um, Do you want the long or short version? <laughs> Whatever you prefer. And how much time we have. Um, I'll, I'll try to, if it gets too long, just cut me off. Okay. How about that? Uh, so I started, uh, I was super into them uh, eventually. The first time, like I said, I got, and I tried to get into them, I hated it. And I was like, I don't, I'm just going to go back to Poison the Well because I can understand what's happening. I, kind of stuff. <laughs> oh, I, like Opposite of December was one of my favorite records oh, in high school. Absolutely. So good. So yeah, good. At the I time now, uh, I don't. It. I mean, it's not not a knock or anything, but like listening to that record now, it, it like nostalgia kicks in. But like mm-hmm. the songs don't hold up as well to me. But like I still obviously love that whole era of music. Um, totally. So uh, I was into that stuff. Had eventually gotten into Dillinger with enough tries, and you know, it actually made me connect when I saw it live. Like that really. Like, it was like, oh yeah. Okay, now it makes sense. When you're just listening to it in front of speakers, it's like it's it's very abstract. It's hard to like yes. process. Um, so then I actually saw the guitar player Brian at the Rockaway Mall, like where I lived. I lived mm-hmm. in Rockaway, and I was with uh, a friend of mine at the time. And I was like, we were like, is that him? And like you know, like Dillinger locally wasn't like a huge band. They were just like right. you know like a big local band, I guess at the time. It was a long time ago, and. Uh, you know, I was like nervous to like walk up to him, but I did. And I was like, hey, man, like, are you in Dillinger's Cape Plan? And he was like, yeah, I am. And he was super nice, super cool. I mm-hmm. uh, was with his girlfriend. And I was like, hey, do you give guitar lessons? Like, I just totally like, I'm the nice. kind of person that will always just like go for it mm-hmm. <laughs> and see what happens. Cause if you don't, you don't try, you don't know. Right, so he right, was right. like, ah, uh, you know? Mm-hmm. So he was like, I don't, but Ben, the other guitar player, probably does. So here's the, and back then there was no like, real cell phones or like stuff like that. So he gave me like their card. I probably still have it somewhere. Wow. So it was like his card or Ben's card and it was like a deal with escape land, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. So super excited. I called up Ben and like we, we connected and mind you, like I said, I was into much lighter stuff at the time. I was just yeah. dabbling into like extreme music. Um, and so I was a pretty poor guitar player. Like I, I you know, like I could, uh, I could, like, hold it down rhythmically, I guess, but, like, I was not good. Like, mm-hmm. you would never, ever in a million years put me in this band. Right. Um, and I was super nervous when I first, like, started doing lessons with him that, like, the basic exercise, like, one, two, three, four on different strings mm-hmm. kind of thing, yep, I dramatic. literally could not get through it because yeah. I was so nervous in front of yeah. him. Because you're like, course. you know, he's this guy, you know, at the you know at that point in my life, like I didn't know him. And I was just like, I just saw him like destroy the stage, like Rex Plex or something. And right. Oh my God. Um, Rex Plex. Right. Yeah. I remember that place. I do. Yeah. Um, and, uh, so like, I have to now play guitar right in front of him with no one else in the room. Mm-hmm. And I could, I just couldn't do it. I could not get through it. Uh-huh. And, uh, he was super patient and he was just like, okay, you know, like, just take your time. You know, like, you can tell, like, I can tell when I'm recording someone that's super nervous. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I used to suffer from bad anxiety, performance anxiety, too. Like, I mm-hmm. had to do, um, I work at William Patterson University. I'm a professor there. No, and no kidding. Okay. Yeah, it's 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 small world because, like, I went there for right. audio engineering okay. and now I teach there. Um, but uh, when, I, when I tried out for that program, I had to audition in front of a panel of judges and uh i had to play like all these like a bach beret and blah 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 yep and i just couldn't get through it it was just mm-hmm. like the worst performance anxiety ever and just totally like shut down and it's and you know i wouldn't let me in either it was terrible so i i had to do that at berkeley and, oh, it's rough right oh uh, I, I thought 
I thought I was good before I went to like, or, you know, adequate enough. Yeah. And um, I think I auditioned with like Erotomania by Dream Theater. Oh, and, yeah. And, and I just did the rhythm section of it. And they're like, so where's the solo? I'm like, <laughs> you, I have to. <laughs> so, <laughs> I just want to, I'm being a rhythm player. I don't want to do the solo. <laughs> like, that's really yeah. hard, you know. Oh, so, man. And I, uh, out of, I think, you know, they have like eight levels. It's like level one to level eight or something like that. And I thought, I was like, oh, I'll get it at a four. No, I got yeah. it straight at a two. <laughs> <sighs> yeah, I, I didn't make my first audition either. Yeah. They totally were like, nah, dude, your shit can't. And I was like, all right, well, I tried yep. again. Second time, uh, I, they've they've let me in the second time. I think I, mm-hmm. because they either like felt bad for me or because I had invested enough time into it, where they were like, "Okay, let him in." I don't know yep. because I tried out. Me, and my friend Alex, who played uh, played in the band Number Twelve, looks like you. I don't know if you're familiar with them. Oh, at all. yeah, I remember that band. Yeah, yeah. So like him and I are very close. We've been close for since college and before, mm-hmm. and we were both auditioning for the same program. He also didn't get in the first time. And then he, I don't think he got in the second time either when I did get in. And he's like, he's like up here and I'm like down here. So right. like, I think they kind of like, just like let me in because he was mm-hmm. way more prepared and he's a way better guitar player. Um, I don't know. But um, so anyway, performance anxiety for sure. That's how I ended yeah. up getting there. And uh, so Ben and I, he just, he would teach me when he had time. Um, and it wasn't necessarily all about like, teaching me guitar because I was mm-hmm. I, honestly he was a he was a decent guitar instructor but he was way more interesting as like telling me about inside stuff inside baseball mm, type sure stuff. right yeah you know because like he he was my in to like that world and I didn't right. you know I was a local like performer playing in my band like the glitter and stuff like that and like you know I had a small picture of like what that world was like and I like but he was in it you know and he knew yeah. all the things and like could tell me all the stuff so like when we would go off on tangents and just talk about the industry and stuff like that, I was far more interested in that stuff than like how to play a diminished scale or something, you know, like, right. which I could just look up on the internet. Sure. Um, so he would teach me when he could, but then he would obviously inevitably go back on the road and um, then I wouldn't see him for like, you know, six months, eight months or something like that. And then like, you know, like enough of that back and forth after a couple of years, like we just kind of like lost track and didn't really hang out much. So um, I ended up going through school and uh, graduated college, and um, I could either go and I was interning at CNBC and do like the corporate track, Mm -hmm. or I had this opportunity because my band had gotten kicked out of our second rehearsal space because we were just so obnoxious, Um, and we needed a new one, and the place I'm sitting in right now was for sale. And I was like, yeah. And this place was where Dillinger started rehearsing from the beginning. No way. Wow. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. So, I mean, I could can't really move the camera around to show you everything, but like yeah. it's a 7,000 square foot spot where the bands have been rehearsing for like almost 20 years at this point. And uh, we had, we practiced down the street, like walking distance from here. And um, I didn't know it at the time but this place is so like it's literally in underground and it's like hidden like there's no signs anywhere for advertising for it so even as a person like playing in this scene down the street we never knew of its existence (laughs) um but anyway the opportunity came up and we made it happen i bought the place Uh, i took this track instead of the corporate track Mm -hmm. and um I when I was down here, you know, obviously uh, Dillinger, we ran into them and started you know rehashing things and talking to them and stuff like that. Eventually, uh, they heard us practicing, and you know, like my band Knife the Glitter is like, you know, a lot of influence is taken from Dillinger, King Crimson, mm-hmm. all that kind of stuff. Right. Um, a band which Ben told me to get into because I was like, oh, that 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 like clean section and forty three percent burnt, like. Like, where mm-hmm. does that come from? Like, it's so alien to me. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't know, I'm not sure if you're familiar with that that part, but it's just like super, like, it's it's, it's so crazy. Cir- oh, it's like the circus music part to me. Yes, exactly. Yeah. It's yeah. got that vibe for sure. Um, yeah. And essentially what that riff is, I mean, it's a way crazier, like, uh, version of like a King Crimson idea. Mm-hmm. Uh, just move, transposed a little bit and kind of thing. So like, he was like, if you're into this, get into King Crimson. And I was like, really? And then when someone tells you 
to get into King Crimson, it's a very dicey thing to say because like they have so, they've been a band since the '60s mm-hmm. till now, and they have so much content and so much diverse content with different members that like you can't just be like jump in. You have yep. to be like, what kind of stuff do you like? Mm-hmm. So like, if he would have been like get into this era, I probably would have been like super into it. But like, I just jumped in and I was like, ah, I'm not sure I grabbed. It was the same thing again. Like I needed to revisit it like a couple years yep. later. And then it was, like, my favorite band of all time. Totally. <laughs> so maybe that's just me, but I have to, like, I what's have to your, be targeted. Uh, what's your favorite uh, Crimson record? Probably Discipline. Yeah, Those three probably. in the mm-hmm. middle. I actually yep. have them hanging up in one of the back hallways. Oh, um, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah, I, those three for me are the 80s and the mm-hmm. 90s too, but like the 80s is like Adrian Ballou s- sells it for me. Like without I, him, same. I don't care. That That's, like, yeah, the first time I heard Frame by Frame, that's what oh. did it for me. My God, what a song. Yeah. Oh, it's just, yeah, amazing. I love that song. Yeah. Um, so, so um, anyway, he saw, he heard us rehearsing and, you know, we were chatting it up. And then at some point, he was like, Do you want to come on tour with us, uh, your band? And I was like, What? <laughs> like, we're just like local nice. dudes who like try to do like small mini tours with like bands like Psyopus and stuff like that. Like, like we're not. This is a big jump for us, yep. but you know, like when we would talk amongst each other, um, we would be like, "Okay, what would be the ba-? like?" You know, you have these like like discussions amongst each other, like what would be the band that you could tour with and then call it afterwards? You know, like what would be that band? And all of us unanimously were like Dillinger. <laughs> we're yeah. like, if we could tour with that, and this is before we got asked. We like that was the band we would pick, and we got asked as it would be and we were a good band like we were like for that kind of music it was very tight and very focused and we we had a good mm-hmm. good vibe going uh and so ben picked up on that and the, it was a nice offer because not only did we get to play with them we got because we were only a three piece he was like if you want we have spare bunks you guys can bunk on the nice on the- we're on the bus with us. Right. So we're like, what? <laughs> we're going to be in the tour bus? We don't have to worry about a van or anything or a trailer? So we, it was like we could shack up with them. We could store our gear in their place. We could uh, just ride with them. And um, the only catch was like, you know, like I had the tech for them, like guitar tech, which was fine because mm-hmm. I was interested sure. in that anyway. And that's obviously right. like, you know, at the time you asked me to do that, I'd be like, yes, please let me do that. Totally. Um, and like our bass player was like in charge of merch and our drummer did like miscellaneous stuff or something like that. So we were put to work, but it was like, we got paid, which yes. we weren't used to getting paid. Like when we mm-hmm. played shows, like if we just like were allowed to play, that was big enough right. for us, you know? Right. Um, and then, so this was like, you can't really ask for more for this is ridiculous. Yeah. We got put in front of these shows for an audience that was receptive, which isn't always mm-hmm. the case, you know, for like abstract math core. Yep. Um, and it was you get to play with your heroes, and it, it was awesome. Like it was, we we left that tour and did like like a homecoming show or like a couple of shows here and there with like Behold the Arctopus or something like that. And mm-hmm. it just it just wasn't the same. Like it was right. just like uh, or Dysrhythmia. I can't remember. I think it might have been them. I I saw them at the Knitting Factory. I think. yeah, they're dude, they're yeah. crazy good. Yeah, if yeah, you if your brain can handle that, it's like mm-hmm. ooh, there's not much else like that for sure. Yep. Um. But yeah, like after that, we did like these other smaller shows, and we were just like, let's just let's just do what we said and call it. <laughs> like ended on like the high note that we have just in our like brain that. instead yeah. of like, forcing this, right, right. Which we did. Um, yeah. We put out some material after that, but like um, that was it for that. And then so that was cool. So then actually after that, Ben was like, I'd like to like keep you on as a tech cool. um, for the band if that's cool, and we're gonna go to Europe and stuff like that. And like obviously, I was like, yeah, sure. Right. I'd love to. Um, and I still had the studio to take care of. So I, it's tough trying to balance some of that stuff, like a business that you're starting essentially mm-hmm. and like growing and then being away from that. Yeah. But uh, it's a good exercise to learn how to do that. And uh, went on the road, like, you know, there's so many things that you learn on the road mm-hmm. um, that I, it's like impossible to even talk about. But um, so that was great. Um and then uh, eventually that, I guess, being on the road with them just, like, got me a lot closer to the to the guys, you know, working with them. And then Ben doesn't live far from from the studio, mm-hmm. or at the time didn't, anyway. 
And yeah. so we would just like, we just end up hanging out all the time, um, right. watching movies, movie nights, just whatever, anything, you know, just hanging mm-hmm. out, being bros. And then one day we were at like shooting range. I took him out to a shooting range and then he was talking about one of their guitar players. And I was like, what's, what's going on with that guy? And he was like, he's actually leaving uh, after this Nine Inch Nails Soundgarden tour. And I mm-hmm. was like, like, I didn't expect that answer. And then right. again, shot in the dark, just like yep. totally fucking like half serious. I was like, you want me to try out? You know, <laughs> just throwing <laughs> it out there and just see what happened. Yeah, yeah. I didn't even think I was capable of playing this band. Right. Um, so he's like, just like, I don't know what was going through his mind, but he was like, yeah, go ahead. And I was like, what? Right. <laughs> like, seriously? Right. And he was right. like, yeah, give it a shot. And I was like, okay. And that was it. There wasn't like any like, guidelines or any kind of like tips or mm-hmm. it was just like yeah go ahead and i was like okay so i had that that week was a rough week for me because i had to like decide what i was going to do with, yeah. <laughs> with that with that option um and uh you know my wife that was not super stoked in the beginning <laughs> because like we had just like got this house mm-hmm. she had i had worked for deftones before and todd rungren and other people and stuff okay and i had t- got a taste of what it's like for me to be away mm-hmm. and you know like it, it's lonely you know when you're at home and she's an introvert totally. so like it's not like her favorite thing for me to be like hey i'm gonna go have fun on the road and, and you're gonna be here right by yourself so mm-hmm. um she struggled with that for a little bit but I mean, obviously in the end it worked out fine and uh, yeah, I just, it was, a, it, that was a really tough time in my life because I had to like work these long day sessions in the studio, you know, like yep. 10 hour plus sessions and then immediately afterwards get home or stay here and then just like grind learning the Dillinger songs by myself. Like they're yep. like, there's no tabs that work. There's no How sheet music. How did you go about learning those? <sighs> I'm not the best guitar player in the world, but I have a really good ear. Right. So okay. um, that was obviously uh, developed a lot more in college when we did ear training and, and stuff right. like that. Yeah. So um, yeah, for so for instance, like the uh, in college, our our teacher would go behind the piano and play like some jazz chord, and he would be like, "Okay, he would just sustain it or keep hitting it," and then he'd be like, "I want everyone to write out that chord on okay. the, on you know," and mm-hmm. I was just like. That's you have to really start to break down chord structure and intervals and start with the root and like build from there. Right. And doing that really builds a great foundation of understanding, you know, like the chord structure and like just like picking out notes, which is when you're listening to Dillinger, it's not like really um it's all super dissonant. You know, it's yeah. a lot of flat fives and like all yep. kinds of like dim- diminished runs and whole tone scales and stuff like that. So like once you start to find the identifiers and work with that. Then you can start to understand the language, which is right. its own thing. Um, it's not like they're the first band to ever do that. Like like Crimson was doing stuff like that a long time ago, and before that, and before that, and before that. But just they have their own way of interpreting that kind of vibe. And uh, Ben isn't necessarily like a like a like a classically trained musician or anything. Where none of those guys really are. Mm-hmm. So it's like uh, asking them about the stuff is sometimes tough. Oh, hi, Cat. I didn't see yeah. you there. Oh, yeah, he's... Whenever I do something like this, he just decides that he's going to be a part of it. Now's and the time. Now's the time. At least, like, he's not running around. He's just camped out on me. That's or cool. Is it, which is fine. Whenever I'm trying to track vocals, then they want to yeah. sing, too. Or <laughs> like There have been times, actually, I was, like, I was recording this piano piece uh, a few years ago, and it was really quiet because I, I close-miked it, like... I don't know. Like what I like to do a lot is I'll, I take a, I just put the felt down and it's just an upright. It's like a Yamaha U3 mm-hmm. and I'll, uh, I'll put the 184 is like an inch maybe off the felt just so yeah. it, it gets so percussive and noisy. So right. I'm playing really softly to do this thing. And you know, the mics are cranked and I'm just holding out the last chord. And then one of them just goes, <laughs> <laughs> and that freaked him out. But the most amazing thing, the fucking meow was in key. Oh my god, that's so it, great! It, it, it you gotta lives. Keep it then. I kept it. You gotta keep it. <laughs> but do you yeah, pay him uh, royalties? <laughs> uh, you know, I've I've actually like looked to see if I could write them off on taxes. <laughs> yeah, you know, like, there's always you know, a way. Is this technically a business expense? Yeah, and, you just gotta find the right accountant who can fudge it. Right. I mean, 
I've got a wonderful There's Jewish guy in, in Long Island. So you think, yeah. you know, yeah, but there's gotta be someone. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, I didn't know that you recorded stuff. I'm sure that we have a whole another thing. Oh, oh about, we, too. we, we do. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, Jake told me, obviously, uh, you know, you're super gear nerdy and all that too. Which, yeah. Uh, I definitely, I mean, I'm, I'm really nerdy about, uh, God, I guess Pro Tools is where I got the nerdiest, probably. But, really? Um, just, I'm so hyper editing focused, but mm-hmm. I mean, I I love. I've got a bunch of analog synths and guitar, a bunch of guitars and whatever. But uh, actually, what I do geek out the most on is guitars, still to this day. Yeah. Just because. Cool. Well, I mean, uh, I have a lot of those here for sure. They're yeah, all I, I see I mean, a few behind you. There's. I think Jake's. I don't know how, how the crop is in the actual view, but mm-hmm. like. In this view, I can see four, but Jake's is just over that way. He uh, he he gave that to me recently. Oh, the I, okay, yeah. I yeah, I just see. I basically see above your shoulders. So yeah, I see. Gotcha. Yeah, the yeah. blue, the green, the polka dot. Yeah, gray so that's the Jericho. Out. The green is an Aristides. Oh and yeah. Then there's a Kiesel, and then there's another Jericho, and then there's a bunch of others around. There's like okay. a billion. Do yeah. you, uh, out of curiosity, do you keep them all in like different tunings or are they all just the same? And, um, we, they are in different tunings. Uh, yeah. I try to honestly keep them in like E standard, <laughs> but the, the people that work, the work in here, they just take it and they'll, you know, change it to whatever they're using it for. And right. then, you know, like actually, what, two days ago, I had a client come in and they, they grabbed one of the ones that was an E and just tuned it to drop C. And I'm like, just and like they were that. having some tuning issues. And I'm like, hey, man, you know, this is not uh-huh. ideally how you want to do this. <laughs> yeah. Um, you want to like change the strings and put them in like yep. a, you know, a thicker gauge so that it holds better. Yep. But he doesn't care. He's just like, he just writes the songs and we kind of just make it work. So it's, it's, you know, a lot of tuning problems. <laughs> I, I'm sure it's funny. Like, I, I had this thing in my head for a minute that like, well, I, I need a different guitar for every tuning I use. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I use a lot of, like, I love alternate tunings. Um, yeah. I think that like when I was in high school, I, I, I studied, um, I studied classical guitar, but my teacher got me into acoustic finger style. Mm-hmm. So like all the Michael Hedges, Khaki King kind of stuff. Oh, wow. Yeah. And, she was awesome. Oh, she, she's a, is awesome. she is awesome. She is yeah. awesome. Yeah. She's incredible. And, and they would do, you know, gigantic, big open tunings. Mm-hmm. And, um, so then I started, you know, thinking like with electric guitars, especially because like a bunch of mine have tremolos, and I actually, to be honest, hate tremolos. But oh man, I went through the phase of love hate, but now I'm back on love, and a bunch of mine have them. They're like, they're better now. The hip shot ones are so much easier mm-hmm. than the than the Floyd ones are to mm. manage for sure. Well, I just any I've I think I only have two with Floyds, and I've blocked them both. But yeah, um, but then I discovered the tremolo no thing, which uh huh. It's fantastic, but yeah. uh, I still prefer, like, I love the feeling on my hand of a tunematic bridge. Yeah. yeah. That, to me, just feels the best, but... I would I would probably agree. I have a yellow Vigier in that corner there that has, yeah. uh, like, a hard tail kind of tunematic, and it's... I agree. It does feel incredible compared to, like, this big system that you have to, like, rest on. Yeah. And then when you put your arm into it, it bends, and you know, it bends sharp and stuff like that. So I would... I do prefer that, but, like... If you weigh the ability to not have a trem arm, like I'm gonna always mm-hmm. pick the trem arm. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, yeah. It's, it doesn't ever cross just my brain. Mm-hmm. I never, I because I'm always thinking of like, oh, if I, it's gonna be such a pain in the ass to tune. Yeah, Every, that overshadows everything for you. You're like, I don't want to tune this. <laughs> yeah, basically, because like even if I'm just like you know dropping one, like dropping a low E or something like that, then just the whole. I know it's so like silly and simple but like it's gonna make everything else go sharp yeah uh, it depends how it's set up but you're mostly yeah. correct well when i was in when, I, when we would do shows and i would play one of my other vigiers with um a shaller bridge mm-hmm. on it um yeah. i had it set up so that it's only um it doesn't go up it only goes down oh uh, okay right right so i had it already bottomed out so when i dropped to d if we ever needed right. to go to d it yeah. was already bottomed out so it's it stayed Right. And I could still drop, you know, lower. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. That worked. The, the killer for me is like, yeah, the ones, uh, I have a few PRSs that all, that mostly have the trim and mm-hmm. they're floating. So yeah, yeah uh, I just, I trouble. Yeah, no, them. it's definitely a pain. It's definitely, certainly it, it's, it's, you got to really weigh it 
you know and, I, and when i was younger i didn't care about them at all like you yep. know no none of the bands i listened to at the time like we're using them anyway. Like I wasn't, I didn't grow up on like good metal. I grew, grew up on honestly like crappy, like new metal stuff. So like no one was playing leads I mean, and stuff. Yeah. But you know, what's funny about that? I go back to the, I mean, how old are you? Uh, 38. Okay. All right. Yeah. Ancient. So I'm 35. And, um, <laughs> so yeah, so you and Jake are like exactly the same age. Yeah. Um, but I go back to those new metal records that I would make fun of when I was a teenager. And now mm-hmm. I listen to them and so I'm like, man, these hold up. <laughs> which ones do you like still i'm curious because um, i haven't gone back and tried so this took me well i never liked lincoln park when i was younger uh-huh. and now i'll go back and listen to meteora from time to time and it's like for the genre it's a fantastic record yeah and, and then the other one that i come back to periodically and i can't listen to all of it by any means but um i think the second stained album breaking the cycle okay uh i remember being into the first one uh yeah song home that was there. their heavier one i think the right? heavy one yeah yeah and yeah i mean break the cycles where they it's been a while and you know they got they really hit the mainstream but yeah. listening back to it now like those songs i mean the guy was an incredible singer i mean mm-hmm. he still is i don't know if you've listened to his new stuff it's drastically I, I haven't uh kept up with him i mean i used to like all that stuff like my uh if you saw the my room the yeah. posters, it was like a Roadrunner Records right. like like throw up explosion. It mm-hmm. was it was awful. Like I'd be super embarrassed to show anybody these photos now, but like it was there was not a spot left on the wall where there wasn't some trendy Roadrunner Records band, you know, that was covering it. Yeah, yeah. I mean yeah. I will say if you want some entertainment, go look up Aaron Lewis's new stuff. Okay. Uh he he went the country route. Let's just put it that way. Okay. All right. And went trying very, to get some bucks. <laughs> yeah, trying to get some bucks. Uh, it's like hard right Trump country. Um, dude, it, I gotta say, there's a huge fan base for that. They're it's most just not certainly. Where we live. <laughs> oh, oh no, no, not actually. Yeah, I bet you have a fair amount of it. Or I mean, you're more rural. Uh, I mean, there's. I mean, yeah. So like, it's it's really weird. Like, if I go down my street. My area where I live is like totally weird. We're in the woods, but like yeah. there's like super like multi million dollar man like like mansion houses on the lake, right. and then there's like these shitty like rundown shacks like on the same road. It's so weird, and like yeah. there's a right on my street there's like a little tiny side road that we walk our dog down and stuff like that, and that's like mostly smaller houses, and then there's like these two or three houses that like you can see clearly what these guys are about mm-hmm. they ha- one guy has a, a f- and i don't care who you vote for like we're not going to get into the politics but like you yeah. know that's a whole side thing sure. um the uh, he's got a, a a banner that's massive over his garage that says fuck joe biden <laughs> <laughs> and then it says and if you voted for him fuck you too and i'm just like wow. that guy doesn't give a fuck man that guy is literally telling you without even meeting you how it is they, they <laughs> never him. I read this incredible uh, article. It was of course, like it was like Fox Business or something. So I knew it was going to be yeah. something. But yeah. Um, yeah, some guy in Florida, it was Florida man, of course. Um, <laughs> he gets kicked off of uh, a United flight because he was wearing women's underwear as a face mask. And of course, wow. yeah, and of course had a, uh, a, Let's, and a Let's Go Brandon t-shirt on. And <laughs> I mean, the audacity is actually incredible. So yeah, I just, they're only Florida man material. They, <laughs> yeah. Where did you ever like in Florida, Miami? What's that? Where do you like to play in Florida? Um, I don't. I don't think we played too much of Florida. Really? Um, I mean, I, yeah. I don't know. Maybe we did. I don't. I would I don't imagine there's like being... the Gainesville scene and stuff like that. Ah oh, man, I'm I'm thinking on the tours that I was on. I don't yeah. remember if we hit Florida or not. No, I can't remember. I probably probably when we like maybe when I like was a tech for them, but I sure. don't know if we did that. Uh, I definitely remember playing Florida with my old band, and it was like a seemed like a Nazi biker bar type place or something, something awful. Yep. We were like, let's get out of here. <laughs> I actually but, always uh, found Orlando to be the scariest, ironically. Yeah, which is yeah. You know, you get off the plane if you're flying at least, and yeah, oh, it's like it's not the happiest place on earth. 
I promise you. That. <laughs> not if you live there. I'm certainly not if you live there. I Even as I a would... visitor, I'm like, get me the hell out of here as soon as possible. <laughs> Stay within the park areas for sure. All right. And I was, I was always, I would be doing like DJ sets in downtown or something like that. So yeah, I, yeah. I toured as a DJ for ten years. So oh wow. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, that's how I toured, and it was a uh, cool. different. I've always been envious of the bands because you got to all do it together. Like when you're talking about how, you know, your first big tour with Dillinger and, you know, they, they pull everyone on the bus together. I'm just thinking like, Oh, I'm so envious because for me, <laughs> it was just like, it was just me and a suitcase on the road by myself. Yeah. And yeah. Well, can't you can't, you talk to yourself. I mean, that's a good time to start, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, the worst thing was I, I think I would, after say doing like three months and it wasn't like I'd be on the road for three months straight. It would be three right. days a week or something like that but it was all fly dates. And after, um, if I were doing that for, yeah, 12 weeks or something, I'd get home and I would just be so dead inside. It was, Ugh, it's tough, man. Yeah. You got I mean, too? just the, the travel, uh, yeah. the, the travel, like, I guess, uh, just wears you down. Just like the, the flying and stuff like that. Uh, I, that's something I never even got used to was like yeah. when the band got to that level, the amount of flying that you'd have to do for like the show, it just, it, it mm -hmm. almost sometimes it didn't seem worth it. You're just like, man, yeah. we have to fly on a plane front there and back for like, I don't know how many hours it was to mm -hmm. in for India and yeah. you play one show and you fly home. Mm -hmm. And it was like, I, I don't know. It's cool to do it, but like, it's, it's definitely it, probably not it's worth it. It's not the, uh, <laughs> the luxury that it's made out to be. Yeah, no, man. I mean, sitting on a plane and it, and I have a back issue yeah. Um, and sitting on a plane, not in a super comfortable position for that many hours, it was like, it's, it's really fun. hard. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I had those issues too. Yeah. And still, I, I just, I'm flying to New York next week for the holidays and I'm just dreading a six hour flight. Yeah. You know, six hours is rough because it's like, that is a lot of time. Mm -hmm. Um, you, you, you'll survive. <laughs> I'll survive. I, 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 I've done it too many times. I mean, it's not even yeah. direct, but uh, yeah, no, I'm. Oh, non-direct uh, sucks too. That's like a whole nother anxiety it, thing it, you have to deal it with. It is. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, especially now, I'm, man. Now it's like a shit show. It's they they can't oh my like God. find pilots to like hold the amount of like restricted time they're allowed to fly. Yep. And so they're doing all this like last minute like. It's an it's a mess. Like just for that yeah. alone, I don't even want to fly at the moment. It's so oh, bad. It was I started flying frequently again, I want to say back in May. I was going to Nashville basically every month. And even the first time I went, I was flying southwest and they mm -hmm. canceled three days of flights just in a row. Yeah. And I was just stuck and they blamed it on weather and it wasn't weather. Of course. Was, no, 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 no. There's there's so much stuff behind that's mismanaged or something. Because yeah. we had the same thing. We came back from the Virgin Islands and it was it was on JetBlue, who usually yep. we found to be usually very good. great. Yeah. Worst flight situation I've ever been on. We'll never fly there again. Ever. Really? It was so bad. It was such a waste of time and what happened? It's just honestly, like you could have a day, you're you're on vacation, it's beautiful, you're having the best time of your life, and then you're on the plane. The next day, dealing with the stuff, and it's the worst day. <laughs> it's so much stress and anxiety, and it puts you in such a shit mood. Yeah. And you know, thankfully, I'm there at least with my wife, so we can be shitty together. But mm -hmm. um, it's just wow, what a polarizing situation <laughs> when you're on a vacation to just be in this like we, like we were stuck on the plane for like hours and hours. They wouldn't feed oh. us. We couldn't get off. Like it's just so ridiculous. That's... And they again, they they have some ridiculous excuse that mm -hmm. they keep telling everyone to make them go oh, okay. Okay. Well, they but always it's just say we're, that. you know, we'll be on the air soon, or you know, ten minutes, or they keep pushing yeah. back the ten minutes. Turns into hours like, and hours. Yeah, I, I've had that. You're where essentially I'm, held hostage. You can't you do are. anything. You can't go anywhere. They and the yeah. crazy thing is, sometimes they wouldn't even like give you water. Yeah, so, it, yeah. it's bad, dude. And it's, and the thing that sucks is the market is such that you can't do anything. Like, there's no like, like you go to like JetBlue or literally any one of these companies, like Instagrams, and they have a post. Just look at the comments. Any oh, company, oh, yeah. it's all shit talk. Yep. Every post, every mm -hmm. comment, it's crazy. But where, what else are you going to do? You got to fly. I did say with social media, I found at least with planes, um, that is the quickest way to actually get a response from, like, from anybody at, uh, at an airline. I just tweet at them and I say, dear X airline, this happened. And then yeah. within minutes, someone would DM me and then I'd get a phone call and a case number. 
Whereas well, that's, I, that's at least nice. I mean, that is that's definitely yeah. one of the positives of social media. One of the probably few positives of social media is that you can definitely you just have to slam them publicly and then, yeah. you know, make them feel it. And if you but have really uh, like a following, yeah. they're like, oh, like that's what the first yeah. thing they're going to do is like they're a customer service person. Exactly. My wife works in customer like, service, uh-huh. but like um, they're going to probably check like, is this person like have a legit following? Because if they do, we have yeah. to attack it now. <laughs> yeah. The, the blue check mark is very helpful. In, yeah, uh, in I'm that sure. Situation. <laughs> yeah. But you silent, it suddenly makes the guy, you know, who's wearing underwear on a plane not seem so crazy anymore. <laughs> Yeah, he's just, he's just, that's his way of dealing with the situation, maybe. Who Pretty knows? much. I mean, like, shit's fucked up. He's just going to play the system. Yeah. And, that's funny. I mean, I, I felt like I've wanted to almost do that anyway. So <laughs> it's I crazy it. out there, man. And it's getting crazier again. So I don't know. Just bunker down. It, Hopefully we'll it, get it, through this. With the, uh, with the pandemic and everything, I mean, you were just probably holed up in the studio the whole time. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was touch and go for a minute. Like, um, yeah. I didn't know what was going to, obviously no one knew what was going to happen. Yeah. Um, I, my job at the university got obviously like shit canned real quick for right. that semester. I would start getting, like kids were talking in the class, like everyone was getting text messages and emails from the university saying, we're, there's a virus, you know, the, no one knew what it was at that point. It was like maybe yeah. something that was on the news once or twice in February or something. And then it just came out of nowhere, it seemed like. And then, Everyone in class is saying like, oh, man, like they're going to extend spring break and blah, blah, blah. And on the, or we may not come back. And I'm just like, settle down, guys, settle down class. Like not, this coronavirus isn't going to be a thing, like totally dumb thing to say. But right, like I right. was like, I didn't think it was going to be a thing. And, uh, you know, it's here. You know, sure enough, it was it destroyed an entire year and then some. Yep. Um, and uh, yeah, now. Uh, so so when I was at the studio, I I got sick at that time too, and like we mm-hmm. had thought it was uh, Corona. It turned yeah. out apparently it wasn't. I just had to get sick with similar symptoms at the same mm-hmm. time. Yep. Um, but uh, yeah, we didn't know what was going to happen. We didn't. The first when the market crashed in two thousand eight, um, it hit a lot of the the guys in our industry in a different way, and they all yep. lost their jobs and like they couldn't pay for their so our places like rehearsal and recording so like we have rooms where people come in by the hour and they rent just to like play and like work on stuff Mm -hmm. and then we have things where they have monthly lockouts where they have the keys to the room and they go in they do their thing right so a lot of those people started like backing out of their leases and stuff Mm -hmm. like that in 2008 and we were we had to talk to our landlord like listen we're like we we just lost all of our overhead here so like what are we going to do um we thought that was going to happen again but because I guess there was so much funding happening on like a government level, so mm-hmm. much assistance, yeah. we almost had no one leave. So we right. thought maybe we were going to lose our shit, but we actually did okay. Um, and I was able to, I couldn't track bands for a long time mm-hmm. for, you know, like half the year maybe or like right. a quarter anyway. Yep. And um, I just had a lot of records on the back burner to mix and master. So I actually kept myself pretty busy with that, which was, which was good. Yeah. Um, so we 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 figured out a way to get through it fine, um, but uh, yeah, it's still it's still weird because you never know. Like you're in close proximity. Like I don't go out much. I don't. We don't do the party thing or anything. Mm-hmm. But like, um, you know, we're in, when I work, I'm in close proximity with the clients for like eight hours a day. So right. if someone is sick, you're gonna get we're it. gonna yeah. get sick. It's not like it's, yeah. it's it's hard to avoid. And then you know there's mask mandates, and then we try to follow those. But like. Every band is different. Everyone has different points of view mm-hmm. and like all kinds of stuff. So it's it's really a sensitive topic to bring up. And yeah. you know, when you go into a creative environment, you don't want to start like being stressed out, and you don't want to like get into politics. Like you don't want to like right. like hey, what? Let's record your songs. Also, like you, you, like yep. you, st- you steer out of that. You mm-hmm. know, for the most part. So it, it's 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 a it's an interesting thing to navigate as a business owner. Um, so anyway, <laughs> a little side tangent on that. No, I but, uh, it, we, it, we got through it. We got through yeah, it. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's fun because fortunately, I, I, I mean, I don't, if I work with a band, which is w- maybe once a year, mm-hmm. and then it's usually like a longer term thing where, you know, I'm like working as a producer for three months or something like that. But, yeah. um, and, but so I'm not dealing with different people all the time though. It's just a yeah. little, like little cluster. And I mean, even like the last couple of gigs I did were totally remote even. Yeah. So, I mean, it's weird. I haven't really, minus like random 
songwriting sessions. I haven't really had anyone anyone in here, and minus like a film crew. Yeah. And so well, it, you're it, safe then. <laughs> That's I, good. I, I'm, I'm <laughs> saying, yeah, no, I mean, like, there's no one in the house except me and the cats usually. So it's, yeah. you know. I mean, I, I just have my like local brewery down the street and that's my, you know, that's how I get away from it all. But yeah, uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely been interesting to see just for me, the transition of like not seeing anybody anymore. And now it's, it's coming back around a little bit, but yeah, I mean, not to the point where, you know, I just, I certainly don't go and party or anything like that. Right. Yeah. I mean, we, me and my wife are mostly introverted people. Like when I get yep. done with my day here, I like want to just go home and, and she does the same thing. We just want to like be, we want to, <laughs> I get punished by typically loud, aggressive music for like 10 hours right. a day, sometimes 12 hours a day or more. Mm-hmm. And like when yep. I get home, the last thing I want is to like be in a noisy environment or yeah. like have conversations with people. So like, just kind of like I need my quiet time for sure. Um, so it, it was actually like not a huge, I mean, you definitely start to feel like a lot of pressure and anxiety at, you know, I'm usually the guy in the room who's like super upbeat and mm-hmm. like, you know, everything's good and we're, let's, you know, let's, you know, have a good time. Yeah. But like there was a moment during the pandemic where I, even myself, I was like shaken a lot. And I was like, man, like I don't, I don't really know what's going to happen in this country or in the world, but like in this country Mm -hmm. with my business, with like anything, because it was just like, no one knew what was going on. They were telling us for a while that you couldn't even open your UPS packages for like a week. Yeah. (laughs) Are you kidding me? This is what we're doing now. Oh Oh, my God. (laughs) Oh, I definitely, I I had a moment where I was spraying them down with Windex. I I know. Who can blame you? They didn't know what was going on and they were just saying like, just don't do anything. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I was like, um, yeah, that sucks. <laughs> uh, uh, it was it was absolutely ludicrous. And like, I've gotten better, and it, now I'll open my mail. Yeah, you know, that's good. That's yeah, good. I, for a while I'd let it sit for a few days, and yeah. uh, I definitely think you know a few things lapsed because I I throw it in the garage and then forget about it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's a void back there, but uh, yeah. I've adjusted. I, I I think you know, like I can open my own gate now and not have to sanitize my hand right after. Yeah, I mean, I'm a pretty filthy individual. No. So even before all this, like, I, if if like a food, like a hamburger or something would fall on the floor, I'll eat it. I don't care. Oh, I used so, like, to. I'm a pretty now gross I won't. person. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but like, um, I don't, I don't know. The the whole thing like was like hit everyone like a ton of bricks. I feel like, and like everyone adjusts differently. Like. You know, some people are like super. I have one client who's like super sensitive and like kind of germaphobe, and he was like losing his mind. I'm sure. You know, and like yeah. I, I empathize with him because it's just like, you know, this is a lot to take on for certain people, certain individuals. Yeah. Like, like you, you don't know what you can trust. You can't trust people. You can't trust that door handle. You can't trust, and you know, like, yeah. and then even outside of COVID, they're having a hard time dealing with germs and stuff like that. And it's like right, this is like right, gotta right. be torture mm-hmm. for them. You know. Yep. So. Yeah, uh, it's, it's, everyone gets a hit differently with this situation, and you know, like, you know. Well, be thankful you're less right. germophobic. Oh yeah, I'm like the opposite. Like, yeah. give me all the germs. <laughs> <laughs> Just give them to me. Uh, I'll, hopefully, my body will sort them out. I'm sure you know there's a limit, but uh, oh yeah, I'm God. a pretty gross person. <laughs> <laughs> Good thing we're remote. No. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, I mean, being on a tour bus probably, yeah. it doesn't, you know, sleeping on floors of, of mm-hmm. houses that are abandoned with no electricity yep. or hot water, you know, that'll do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's, it definitely teaches you a thing or two. But Yeah. I just want to go back to what you were saying, like, um, since you listen to metal, obviously, all day, because, I mean, primarily what you record, I'm guessing, is mostly metal. It, I would say it's any, I mean, it's everything. I have yeah. like my reel is everything, but like right. a lot of focus on like heavy stuff or progressive rock. Right. So anything in with pretty much, I try to say like anything with like most of the time with like an acoustic drum kit, mm-hmm. um, I'm into. Um, right. And I've gotten to, at this point, I've been doing this for over 15 years now. So I've gotten to more, I can be picky with what I want to do. Mm-hmm. I don't have to take everything. Yeah. Well, when I was younger, I had to just say like, I need to pay the bills. Like I'll do anything. Right. <laughs> But yeah. now it's more like, you know, like I can pick my projects and uh, something that excites me is something, else, you know, mm-hmm. with a drum kit, usually a drummer. Or right, something like right, that. right. Yeah. So no drum machines for you. 
I have to. I had to use them the other day. Did uh, you? I have okay. to use them. Yeah, I just hate them. I honestly, I hate <laughs> programming drums. I hate program drums. Right. I, it's not like they don't sound. They can't sound good. They can sound phenomenal. Mm-hmm. Uh, I just don't like the idea behind it, and I don't like the lack of working with that part of the artist. Like I, I like working with the drummer and working through sections and being like, this would be better. And then I don't like having a guitar player program the drum set as a guitar player. I'm like, this sounds. Right. Like it sounds, it sounds like you're a yep. guitar player and you program the drums. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. it's just like yeah, I, I want that. someone in the room who's capable of putting into that. I'm spoiled, man. I've been playing with the sickest drummers and recording the sickest drummers for such a long time that, like, it, working with uh, you know, anything less is like, unfortunately, it's not great. <laughs> yeah, so. no, it, it's I go through that battle a lot because I mean, if I'm doing something, a record that is you know more acoustic, if you will, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I I hate programming real drums too, or like yeah. not like weird electronic drums, but you know, like, yeah, that's a totally different that, thing. Like, if yeah. the aesthetic is electronic, like don't put real acoustic drums in there, please. Sometimes and it works like, great together. Maybe, yeah, it, I'm sure there's situations, but like, like as don't, a layer, I'm not saying that yeah. you should. It should be forced. There should be acoustic drums no. on everything. Like, no, 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 if it needs it, yes, but like. You know, obviously, I do a lot of electronic stuff too, where like we program super weird synthesized sounds that maybe yep. aren't necessarily even per, you know percussive stuff yep which is yep. fun i love yep. that stuff too yeah i mean yeah. you're pretty traditionalist yeah yeah no in yeah. every every way i feel like um mm-hmm. and i don't know if it's because i hang out with old guys but like uh i know i have to do all the modern editing techniques and stuff and yep. like a lot of, of modernization but like analog gear um heavily reliance on the musician's performance mm-hmm. getting the best out of them um, and that's not every time. Sometimes you got to know the artist's limit physically, mm-hmm. and you just can't make them do it a thousand times because you're going to get diminishing returns, and then they're yeah. going to be pissed, and you're going to be pissed, and right. you've blown two hours trying to get them to play an A chord correctly. Right. right. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, yeah, but mostly like I would, I usually think the old guys that are shaking their hands in the air mm-hmm. saying a thing. There's something to that. Yep. Yep. Because yeah. I saw, yeah, no Kempers for you apparently. That's. Uh... Oh yeah, and I was the first guy <laughs> to sell them to you. Like back in the day, with oh, the really? effects or whatever line six thing. Yeah. yeah, I was I was the poster child, man. I would like go to war for those things, mm-hmm. and then I eventually became the old man. Mm. And it's a different reason. It's not because they don't sound good. It's not about Sonics. Almost none of the stuff is about Sonics. It's about like an ethos, or it's mm-hmm. about like a bigger picture. Right. Um, right. And for me, the bigger picture, um, if we want to go down that rabbit hole, was. Um, I did a billion records with the Axe Effects or whatever yep. you know what you want to insert here, sure. um, and they sound fine. They sound great. Like I can get a good sound on them if you know how to use those systems. Mm-hmm. You know, I was I developed Stephen Carpenter from Deftones sound with him on oh, the Axe no Effects, way. and it was sold by Axe Effects. You know, a oh, fractal. cool, right? Yeah. So like I was a big part of that world for a while, um, but in terms of a producer. And someone who changed their stance on like what it is to record a, an artist, um, I, I feel like those units in general do a disservice to the artist and the community, um, and I and I don't like them at all. Hmm. <laughs> so it's a much bigger yeah discussion than just like I don't like the way they sound. They sound right. generic. It's not. It's not about that. Like it's like about a, an ethical thing, or yeah, it really comes down to ethics, and it, it's not something that like it, it came to me quickly. It was something I fought against for a long time. Eventually, came around, and I'm like, wow, okay, so the, I I do understand. Mm-hmm. Some of it is like, um, I mean, I don't want to turn the camera because then it's gonna get out of focus. Yeah, but yeah. like, there's a whole sure. massive wall of like, um, oh, just amp amps, amps over yeah. here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, boutique, like the best of the best, essentially. Yep. Right. Um, it wasn't always like that. I used to just have like an Axe Effects, and yep. I would record bands through that. They would bring in their own like orange head or whatever mm-hmm. amp they wanted, and I would be like, "No, no, no I'm not gonna use that. We're gonna use this thing because I know I, have, I can get great sound on this. So I've spent time tweaking this. It sounds great. Yep. Blah blah blah." Um, you, you could sell the argument a million ways to an artist. You'd be like, "Oh, it sounds the same every time I turn it on." Blah blah blah. Like it's stupid. Sure. Um, who's to say that that's a good thing? And um, so what essentially I ended up doing was robbing them of their identity as a guitar player and just inserting what I wanted it to be because it was easier for me mm-hmm. 
right. as an engineer, I didn't have to put in the sweat or the hours right. to like mic it up and mm -hmm. f adjust their amp and figure out what they wanted. It was yeah. more about what I wanted, you know, and what could streamline the process. And that's that's a horrible thing to do. Well, in that's that situation. also, I mean, that's when you're younger as a producer and you think you're oh, right. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you pull up when I'm now it's it's akin to just pulling up the neural plugin or whatever, right. you know, whatever is hot this month, you mm -hmm. know, whatever just came out. Um, sure. and I'm not knocking the neural stuff. It's fantastic for what it is. And yeah, it's, no, it's a marketplace and those guys are crushing it right now. I just they, got an email from them today yeah, I saw, <laughs> about they, the new product. Yeah. They have a job Patricia one. And yeah, which yeah. I, I saw like, whoa, wow. Um, that was surprising. And like, as far as plugins go, they're probably the best sounding amp plugins. It's yeah, and it's it's honestly like I don't know how much of it's down to I think honestly most of it's down to the cab the cab IR. Uh, it's not yeah. it's not so much the amp. I'm not sure that's a big part of it, but like for the longest time, all these amp plugins just had shitty yeah. cab impulses. Like no one knew how to like do it well. I don't mm -hmm. know why. Like no one was like, man, this this cab IR sounds like trash, and it ruins yeah. everything. Yep. Like I did a video a while ago about like using the same heads through uh, like this this two heads through one cab mm -hmm. and the difference between the two heads right. and then the or taking one head through two, two cabs. different cabs yeah. and it's so much different oh my god yeah. it's like it's like don't even buy more than one head at that point just mm -hmm. buy multiple cabs because if you really want diversity the heads is a little bit but the cab is so much yeah. more that was you know? that was a huge discovery for me for sure yeah and it's another one of those things where you're like, no, no, I don't believe you. You're an idiot, like mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. Um, and then you try it for yourself. And you're like, I can't believe that the same speakers in a different box made by somebody else sounds like completely different. Completely. Where the, the, the different amps going through the same box sound relatively the Pretty same. Pretty close, yeah. Yeah, there's nuances and obviously differences with you can set them. But yeah. like the overall picture mm -hmm. is is the same, which is crazy to think about. Um, yeah, so uh, there's a lot of like lessons I have learned, and yep. it just takes me a long time. Um, but anyway, so I was back to the whole like Kemper thing, why or digital thing, why I don't like that is because I was getting feedback over the years of like doing people's projects, and they were like, "Yeah, no, we everything's great about Kevin, but like you know, like we don't like the process of like coming in and having a like a baked in sound with a guitar. Like right. I want to." You, they want to use their sound that they have potentially well, they want been to be crafting them. over yeah, years. Of course, you know. And I'm just stepping in and being like, no, 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 no. Mm -hmm. We just, you know, we're not using whatever you've been playing these songs on right. for two years or whatever and crafting them with. We're going to use something like for what? Because I don't want to take the time to like make it work. Like that's what mm -hmm. it comes down to. If you were being honest with yourself, your job as an engineer and a producer sometimes is to have the artist come in and record them, mm -hmm. like what they've done, yes. what they're about, what they like, and make it work. That's mm -hmm. your job. Well, so it's, it's um, not about you. That's the thing. It's not about you. It's, a, it's, it's not about, about you. And you can you can ha you can be that guy that it is about you, but that mm -hmm. doesn't that doesn't work for most people, and that's probably not going to land you a lot of gigs. I don't think so, that's the sign of a good producer either. I agree. You're supposed to be objective and listen mm -hmm. and and have a bigger picture of the whole thing yeah. and being like, this is how this sh can work. And I want to adapt your sound or mm -hmm. enhance your sound or whatever, not like completely change your sound. Right. That's that's a different thing. That's not something I'm traditionally about. Yeah. Unless the band is asking for it. Unless they're like, we don't know what the fuck we're doing. Right. We want, we want you to make us sound like you. And yeah. Yeah, and... To be honest, it's a lot less fun when that happens. Yeah, I would I would rather work on because then what you end up doing is just applying what you like to everything, and that and, sucks. And you're just kind of phoning <laughs> it in because you're you're not pushing yourself. It's like, well, I've done this kind of thing before, and I know they like that. Yeah. So then you just keep doing it, and it gets real boring real fast. It, that's that's the thing. It gets boring. And, yeah. And, and at the end of the day, they're happy. So yeah, you know what? Like job done, but on a personal level, yeah, it's. Not exciting yeah. at all. And and I tell all my interns and students the, the 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 biggest rule for me is if you're trying to do this as a business and you want to grow your brand and your business, the only thing that matters at the end of the day, at the end of the project, whatever, is that when they walk out the door, they're stoked. Yeah. So however you get to that is what you need to do. Yeah. It doesn't matter 
how incredible the record sounds, if it's the best sounding record that's come out this year or 10 years, or if it's like a mediocre, like good sounding record that's, you know, whatever, as long as they're happy, mm -hmm. they'll come back and they'll talk about you and then they'll have their other friends come and then their band will break up in two years and then like three guys from this project will start this thing and then the other two will do this thing and hopefully both of them will come back. Because if you just put out the best, and I know from experience because I've talked to, uh, people who know producers that are like aggress too rough on the artist and mm -hmm. they make an incredible product, but the process is so bad that they swear to never go back. Right. So like right. if you put out the best sounding record, but you burn the artist in the meantime and they don't come back to you, like, okay, that's yeah. cool. But do you want to do this as a job or do you want to just do a one-off, you know, and then mm -hmm. have to say goodbye to that artist? I like repeat customers. Totally. I find that the first record is like the learning record where you learn each other. Mm -hmm. And then like the second record is so much more relaxed. Yeah. And you can like, you know the things, like they know the things. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, all right, we're going to do this. We're going to do it better. We're going to do it more efficiently. And we have a better foresight and all the stuff. So the second, third, fourth records are always better, I think, in terms of like the workflow than the first record, which is always like, they're like, what? We have to spend a whole day setting up the drum kit and miking it and getting tones and adjusting heads and blah, blah, right. blah. It's like, well, do you want it to sound like trash or do you want it to sound really like the records that you love? Like, right. which one do you want? <laughs> yep, exactly. So, yeah, if a, lot could, of, a lot of crazy lessons you have to learn. Like, you can't really only be taught. You have to just like learn them in the, in the room. Yeah. If you could produce any artist... Or record, your record. dealer's choice. Yeah. Who would you choose? Any genre? My God, that's such a loaded question. Um, oh man, that's crazy. Um, I don't know, something weird maybe, like the B-52s or something. Yeah, all right. <laughs> Just so like I could be like, what are we doing right now? Right. Like, And you're going to do this now? Like, okay. Something that like keeps me on my toes, I'd feel like yeah. something not like generic, like Mashuga, which would be cool, obviously, but it's just like, okay, I know what I'm getting into. Yeah, I, I, didn't, something, I didn't. Yeah, something I, weirder. I, I expected a different answer than that. Yeah. Yeah, maybe like, you know, something even in like the, the Mr. Bungle type territory mm. or something that just like mm -hmm. every day is like, ugh wow like let's try this let's figure this out like i like stuff like that i don't yeah. people come to me a lot of times for like the different vibe mm -hmm. you know like not something that's just sometimes it's just like i want to sound heavy it's like okay we can do that right. but sometimes i'd rather be as a you know like on a personal achievement like do something that pushes me to work my brain in a different way to try to like you know get achieve that goal you know right no that, yeah I mean, what do you listen to recreationally <laughs> nothing <laughs> <laughs> really? Okay, fair. Yeah, you're yeah. Peace. I mean, it's it sucks. Yeah. It's it's the other side of the sword. But like, you know, like uh, you do like the uh, last week, I had to track a band all day and then like do mix notes maybe, and then mm -hmm. after that, um, work like work with my band uh, right. at night because we're recording next week. So like all this other stuff. So I have fourteen hours of I listen to more music than anyone I know. Right. Yeah. Anyone by, right. by a ton, mm -hmm. and it's not stuff that I'm picking. It's right. stuff that I am doing for work. So my ears are right. on. And you know, when you work on something for even eight hours, after eight hours, mentally, you're exhausted. You know, yeah. my dad's super like blue collar and he like comes in and be like, what are you, you're not working. You're just playing around with buttons and blah, blah, blah. And like, you're right. having fun with your friends. And I'm like, I'm fucking shot after eight hours. Yeah. My ears are turned off. My brain is like, a, you know, you can tell an artist is not used to it when they come in and they play guitar for like a whole session and yeah. they're like completely like done. And yeah. they don't understand why. They're like, I just played guitar for eight hours. I'm like, yeah, dude, but you're hyper mentally focused mm -hmm. for that time. And yeah. it's so exhausting. Yes. It's super exhausting. Um, yeah. So um, I don't know how I got to that <laughs> No, it just, <laughs> I, I get it. Well, it's, yeah, because Jake and I have talked about it. I mean, even like Amish and I have talked about this before too. But for instance, like because of their band, they what they both tend to recreationally listen to is actually electronic music. And, oh, yeah. And because I've always existed more in a bit in the, like the electronic sphere and like the film world and that kind of space, that recreationally what I tend to listen to is more aggressive music, mm -hmm. which is it's just it's, it's so you want the opposite. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. a grass is always greener kind of thing, I guess. Yeah, so, totally. I mean, if I had my take, I'd probably listen to something like classical piece or something yeah. like that. Something that's soothing, um, has like that's not like 
trying to attack me all the time necessarily. But yeah. like, yeah, when I'm in the car with Jake and we're hanging out and he puts on like something like chill electronic, I'm like, dude, thank you. Yep. 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 <laughs> thank you for not trying to attack me with like the super I mean, sometimes he'll show me like what Perfect's working on, but right. like um you know, like just because I like am known for something or had been involved in something doesn't mean that like I need it every second mm-hmm. of my life, you know? <laughs> Definitely the break is important for sure. Nothing was ever worse for me. I'd get off a flight and uh, I was doing a show. Promoter would pick me up and they'd be like slamming. Worse, I've had them play my own music. That was really bad. But, <laughs> Dude, no one ever wants to hear their own like, music. <laughs> no, never. But usually, but they'd like, because I'd be touring, you know, playing techno and stuff like that. So they would just be like slamming techno in the car. And I was like, any anything. Put on, like, yeah. I don't even really like indie rock. Put on indie rock, please. Yeah, just something like, different anything because i'm gonna have to hear this for you know six hours later tonight yep and absolutely yeah and then I it's, my, it's a weird part about the job it's just it's yeah. just like you know like a mechanic who may probably got into it because they love engines they love cars or whatever mm-hmm. and then like they buy like an old car and the last thing they want to do after working all day with their hands and under the car is like go work on their car you right. know like no they'll just <laughs> they just buy a tesla and be done with it <laughs> right so yeah, it's the same thing. Like the last thing I want to do is like expose my brain to like more music usually, and that sucks because I obviously love music. Yeah, you know, um, but uh, it's just one of those things. All right. Well, last thing I'm going to ask you before we wrap it up: What's your favorite thing you've recorded in the last year? Oh my god, uh, whew, that's a hard one, man. Yeah. Um, and it's not because I feel like I would hurt somebody's feelings. Like I care less about that. It's just, That's uh, good. there's so <laughs> many projects and every year I feel like it gets better and better. Like I actually yeah. have like a, a running list on my desktop of like all the things I do when something's completed that I'm proud of. I put it into that folder so I can like have right. it for later. Cool. Um, oh God, there's so many things that I, that I could like pull it up. Um, let me see what's in here. I probably can't even give you a real answer. Um, there's this band I did recently, just because I'm seeing it right now, called Fuzzy Coleman, mm-hmm. which uh, they're they're you know a local band, but they're phenomenal. Like it's very like uh, crimsony with like um, almost like Don Caballero type vibes, okay. like like math rock, but like with good vocals. Okay. Um, and great live show. Is it they're is cool. it out? Ah, I think so. Uh, I think you could probably find it on Spotify or something. They're really fun. What's They're, the name the, again? The new record, Fuzzy, uh, Fuzzy Coleman. Fuzzy yeah, it's hard Coleman. to forget that name. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But there's there's so many records I work on that like our hard drive is always full of like revolving projects. So it'll be yeah. like Monday it's this guy, and then Tuesday it's this chick, and then Wednesday it's this person I haven't seen in three months, and then it's so like unless you're blocking out a ton, like a ton of time. Yeah, okay. Uh, like, you're it, you're working fast. Yeah. Yeah, it's like it's, and then when they they work according to their budget, so right. um, they'll come in and then they'll be like, oh, "My budget's out, so I need some time to to refill." Right, I'll come back in two months, right, and or whatever. And uh, like sometimes though, like next um, in next year and early in the year, we have this artist Will Wood, who's phenomenal, mm-hmm. and he's just booked out like you know like two like like a month plus. Okay. So uh, I don't, and I gave the project to somebody else, mm-hmm. so like I can just like go on vacation there you go <laughs> actually jake and boss. i are talking about going on a trip so we oh, might amazing. Do that. <laughs> there you go yeah um, um well dude. so many bands i don't want to yeah. leave anybody out but the, the list is insane um there's this it's it's ridiculous yeah our hard drive is a two terabyte drive that's working and there's always yep. like 30 projects that are like being worked on at a time so right yeah a lot of stuff yeah that'll get exhausting yeah yeah, it's it's great though. It's you know, yeah. uh, I think I think I'm making a conscious decision that in 2022 to to pull it back a mm-hmm. little bit. You yeah. know, like I'm comfortable enough financially where like I don't. When I was younger, I was like always stressed out over the mortgage or mm-hmm. like the rent or whatever the thing was, the bill was, yeah. and the, the overhead of this place that like I just needed to do everything. Right, and it's just not something you can a longevity strategy. It's just you just can't do it. You get you do get burnt out. Yeah, and um, so now I'm like okay. I'm I'm okay. Mm-hmm. So we're gonna be more choosy this year. We're gonna up the rates a little bit so that we can. Uh, unfortunately, yep. you're gonna have to turn away some of those projects by proxy. Yep. And then just kind of like pick what I want more mm-hmm. and uh, take it a little easier because I'm I'm getting to that point where I'm like my brain is like getting well, exhausted. With that's that's stuff. a great place to be in though. 
So it is. Yeah. It's, it takes, you know, it took me personally like 15 years of solid hard work to get there. Yeah. Um, and I don't like upping rates. I'm not, I'm, I'm not like that kind of person. Um, I feel bad for all the local artists that like, you know, mm-hmm. have to pay money for stuff because they're not getting paid usually. But right. It's the only way everyone tells me, even my artists who pay the money tell me to up my rates. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> it's like, I got to listen to them, I guess. At you, some point. you should. Because yeah. artists are notoriously bad at paying anybody. Yeah. 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 So, you know, it's, 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 it's again, one of those things that you can't be told. You have to just experience yeah. and then arrive at that decision. So, yep. we'll see how that goes. Maybe I'll Good. be out of business next year. <laughs> I hope not, but I, I hope yeah, you get I some, it. you know, I hope you actually take that vacation. <laughs> thanks. Well, dude, thanks so much for being on. And, cool. Uh, I loved it, man. It was a great time hanging out. Nice meeting you, too. Yeah, man. You, too. And um, hopefully we'll see each other, I guess, on the road one of these, or I guess in New York or L.A. or what have yeah, you. Yeah, if you're ever around, just let me know. You know, like, I'm, I'm, I'm here. So, Or if I'm out there, I usually go out to Nam every year almost. Oh, killer. So. Okay, you know what? Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll see you at Nam this year. Okay. Are you going? It's in it's in June, right? It's in June this or July year, yeah. or something. It's yeah. Something. So I'll probably be out there. I'm actually again talking with Jake about like, are you going? Because if you're going, maybe I'll go. Mm-hmm. And if you're not going, then I might not go. So we're gonna see because we might just like it's easier to go with someone. Yeah. I feel like than totally. not. But um, yeah. Uh, hopefully, I'll see you out there. Amazing. I'll see you. Then. Cool. All right. Have a good one. That was me talking with Kevin Antriasian of the Don't Your Escape Plan as well as Backroom Studios. So if you're in the tri-state area and you're looking for somewhere to record, give him a look. Everyone else, go uh, check out the Crystal Method remix of Ordinary Love with Denise Reno. And if you're into guitar pedals and gear, check out Bored to Death with Earthquaker that just came out this past week too. It's on YouTube. See you next week.